Statements by Ministries. The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. Happy Education Week. I am very proud to stand up today to celebrate the students, teachers, staff, and volunteers in our Ontario school system. They are doing excellent work, and as a result, we have made remarkable progress together. Nine years of goodwill between the Liberal government and Ontario's teacher union seems to have evaporated in just six months. How did this collapse happen so we quickly? We respect the bargaining process and the results of that process. We don't tear up collective agreements. Passes Bill 115 that potentially removes the right to bargain and strike from organized labor. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association is concerned that Bill 115 seriously impairs fundamental rights in a manner that cannot be justified in a free and democratic society. The justification is not even that convincing to us. It's not clear that there would have been a strike, or if there were a strike, it would have been of such length to require back to work legislation. It should be the legislature, not the minister, that decides that back-to-work legislation is necessary. But was Bill 115 necessary? Was unprecedented legislation that put arbitrary powers in the hands of ministers necessary? Was it necessary to put a stop to a strike that hadn't even occurred? Was it necessary to strip constitutionally provided collective bargaining rights away from federations? Was there any other way to save a financially strapped educational system? Well, as usual, it depends on who you asked. The Liberals asked renowned economist Don Drummond. Unfortunately, they didn't particularly like what he had to say. They hired someone eminently qualified in Dr. Drummond to take a look at it all at arm's length, commission. Don Drummond, for example, gave us some advice some months ago that we shouldn't roll out full-day kindergarten and that we should let our class sizes go up. You rejected that advice. We rejected that and both of those things would have led to teachers being fired because you wouldn't have needed as many teachers if you didn't have full-day kindergarten and your class sizes went up. Unfortunately, the education minister's map doesn't quite add up. According to the Drummond report, there will be no lost jobs due to teacher retirement. Besides, isn't protecting jobs union territory? No wonder this man looks confused. Mr. Speaker, Walter Gretzky advised his son Wayne that a good hockey player plays where the puck is and a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. We've taken a similar approach to education in Ontario. So was that the politician's game? Were they playing where the puck was going to be, striking down the unions before unions could, well, strike? It's a problem. That, but, you, but, but again, no one was threatening to go out. And part of the reason, I presume in the past, governments passed back-to-work legislation is that somebody threatens to walk off the job. No one was doing that. We continue to have in the schedule in the second week of September a strike votes that are scheduled for the second week of September by the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. I was very pleased last week that the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation delayed their strike votes. Uh, but we need to school, see school not only start. And what was their problem with unions in the first place? Are unions that bad? Union wages in Ontario, which make up one-third of the province's middle-class income, seem pretty reasonable. Of course, there are some non-union salaries that are a little pricier. On the cusp of September 1st, we needed to provide assurance to Ontario families about the choices we would make in the education system, that we would keep the dollars in the classroom. But where were all the dollars? And why was this government so broke in the first place? Why did a government that had grown taxes, grown the deficit, grown the size of government, and grown management costs run out of money? As it turns out, they needed to attack middle-class salaries to pay for some of their high-priced blunders. We're going to be asking all those working Sorry. in education to do their part to help us slow down spending. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. The teachers aren't going to like this. Well, then they shouldn't have wasted billions of tax dollars on e-health and orange. That was you, sir. Shh. It's just... Can uh, I just... Uh, 
So Dalton McGinty came up with an ingenious, dastardly, evil genius kind of plan. Like a mean-spirited anti-Robin Hood, he would take from the middle class and give to the rich. By attacking organized labor, he would take money from these people and give it to these people. But do all politicians see organized labor as a thorn in the side of progress? No, there were a few people who saw it differently. So FDR was in favor of organized labor, but how do modern day thinkers feel about Bill 115's attempts to destroy it? And, you know, I, I'm hardly surprised by it at all. I think, uh, you know, there's been heightened rhetoric, which is somewhat alarming, given the rather minor nature of what's been done. The legislation is totalitarian. If from the perspective of unions, from the perspective of workers, collective bargaining is at the same level as freedom of speech and free democratic elections. It's at the same level. You take it away, you're a totalitarian. But the fact is, you don't have to be a constitutional lawyer to conclude that the proposed legislation is an unprecedented attack on the civil liberties and constitutional rights and freedoms of two or employees. Totalitarian? Unconstitutional? Illegal? Was this really happening in Canada? Or were people just overreacting? Was legislation geared at crushing the labor movement really such a big deal? Well, all we have to do is look at the countries that have strong labor movements. Countries like these. And compare them to countries that don't allow collective bargaining, their right to strike, or strong labor movements. Countries like these. Now, ask yourself, which country do you want to live in? Unions work by collecting dues from their members and then using that money to lobby for better pay, better benefits, and better job security. So are unions a political force for good or are money making machines enriching those at the top? Maybe they're both. But the question is, are we better off with it or without them? For answers, we can look south of the border. In the early 80s, Ronald Reagan was a fan of unions, for a while. I happen to be the only president of a union ever to be a candidate for president of the United States. But then he outgrew them. A strike by air traffic controllers. From the president, a strong warning. They are in violation of the law. And if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. In 1981, Reagan fired 13,000 striking air traffic controllers. It was the beginning of a weakening of the American labor movement. In the decades since Reaganomics took root, the United States has seen its middle class weakened, along with the standard of living. Real wages have decreased, while poverty has risen. Its healthcare system is on life support and its educational system is getting low marks. Fortunately, some people are doing just fine. Thirty years after Reagan began shooting down the working class, American politicians seem to be obsessed with saving it. The people who are having the hard time right now are middle-income Americans. President Obama gets it because he's spent his life fighting for the middle class. Uh, we cut taxes for middle class families uh, by about $3,600. Look, guys, think of this is deadly earnest, man. This is deadly earnest. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are living in poverty today. I believe, I believe that, that we do best, we do best when the middle, when class, the middle class, class is doing well. Doing well. So how is the middle class doing three decades after Reagan's anti-strike legislation took a thriving country in a new economically friendly direction? For the past 40 years, the American middle class has gotten slowly, surely, purposefully, and not terribly gently, screwed. How the middle class got screwed. And there weren't even any long walks on the beach or fondue. The new America is littered with millions of homes lost and abandoned, with the unemployed officially at over 13 million still queuing to get a job. 
Does this mean the middle class is disappearing in the there U.S.? four pillars that supported the American middle class. The chance to retire, the chance to send your kids to higher education, you know, graduate school, university, the chance to work and afford a comfortable standard of living, and access to medical care. And if we look, all four of these pillars are chipped, cracked, or swaying. America's gone from the most egalitarian nation on earth back in the 1960s and early 70s to now where the gap between the rich and the poor is the widest in the United States than any of the industrialized nations. So by every indice, the middle class is dead in America. Around the world, labor movements are responsible for public health care, public education, a reasonable minimum wage, the 40-hour work week, workers' compensation, social assistance, long-term disability insurance, equal pay for equal work, anti-discrimination laws, and the abolishment of child labor. They even invented the weekend. Unions strengthen economies and standards of living while fighting for the rights of the middle class when no one else can or will. Dal McGinty obviously has run out of ideas. So what new brain-busting ideas does the business-friendly conservative leader Tim Hudak propose? Maybe he wants to protect the working class rather than weaken it. Or maybe he has no new ideas at all. If he's out of ideas, he's welcome to mine. A public sector wage freeze for all of us. <laughs> to save $2 billion in fixing a broken arbitration system so you can actually hold the unions accountable. So this man wants to become this man or this man and turn this country into that one. Since Dalton McGinty has quit politics and Tim Hudak wants to keep Bill 115, who can we count on to get rid of it? Will any of the liberal hopefuls take a stand for Ontario's middle class? Or are all of these people really the same person? Canada is navigating tough economic waters. Sacrifice is needed, but Bill 115 could sink the whole ship. Bill 115 is not the answer. Our children have the right to a good education, affordable health care, a reasonable wage, and the same chances we had. Our politicians need to know that Bill 115 is not okay. Bill 115 is not Canadian. Bill 115 is not the way we want to go. Tell them you are saying yes to a strong middle class. You are saying yes to collective bargaining and human rights. You are saying yes to democracy. And ask which one of them will say no to Bill 115. Where free unions and collective bargaining are forbidden, freedom is lost. They remind us that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. You and I must protect and preserve freedom here, or it will not be passed on to our children, and it will disappear everywhere in the world. That's for sure. That's for sure.